it's a big pleasure to be here and uh, thank you Yip, for organizing such a wonderful uh, gathering i'm so excited to meet everyone and understand more of your backgrounds and so you know i'm always impressed by the unit community it's a very very vibrant and um, i think very global community uh, and, and michael has been a, a champion at able to create international uh, dialogue and opportunities so uh, much kudos to to the whole unit ventures team so my name is Max. Um, I am currently um, sitting in Beijing. Uh, I spent my last few years in Hong Kong uh, as well. Uh, my story before starting Carbon Base is that I went to undergrad at Brown. Uh, Brown was a very international facing place. It was very you know keen to develop um, uh, multidisciplinary um, change makers. Uh, and a lot of our classmates actually have gone to do impact related fields. You know, one of the alumni from Brown now is running ahead of sustainability at Google. Uh, another one's working for uh, Biden's administration as uh, one of the uh, special advisors to the Sustainability Council. So, you know, we see or see a lot of this sustainability DNA in the alumni uh, community. Uh, I studied a mix of uh, applied math, computer science, and biology. Uh, my father was a biologist, so I spent some a lot of uh, early childhood years in the laboratory and had an appreciation of the. Uh, intricacies and delicateness of, of biological life and then how you know we are currently affecting the ability of the planet to actually have you know caring capacity to hold all of us um, and our activities. Um, when I graduated I had a chance to work uh, you know in, in my sort of leading graduation chance to work at NASA Ames uh, where I did some experiments on synthetic biology and um, thinking about what it would take to actually to build biological tools for astronauts as we went to visit, you know, um, space and how do we sort of create new manufacturing processes um, uh, using uh, biology uh, to later on uh, spending a summer at Singularity University, which is a, a very dense concentration of uh, people who are very keen to use technology to have massive scale impact in the world. And I think a lot of my craziness uh, later on in life came from the summer I spent actually at SU, where the challenge was that you had to sort of figure out ideas that can positive impact the lives of a billion people uh, in the duration of your lifetime. Uh, so it's a force to do the dream very big. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, um, I became a data scientist and worked in uh, a Silicon Valley uh, technology company. It was started by the Stanford head of uh, applied math. Um, and there had a chance to service large companies uh, in um, finance and drug discovery around the use of data. Um, in 2016, I came to Asia. That was a new chapter for me. I started a master's program in Tsinghua at this place called Schwarzman Scholars Program. It was a gathering of about 110 people from 30 countries. Um, and it was the idea was then to address the seemingly growing cultural divide that was happening between you know, United States and China and, and the world. Uh, and actually take a lot of people with a lot of uh, interesting global backgrounds and have them live in China for a year, and sort of see China from the first hand, you know, overcome a lot of the potential biases that, that we might have about what you know, the rise of China actually means. Um, and for me, it was a rediscovery of my Asian heritage. I had sort of grown up in the States. I've lived in Europe a little bit um, and seeing China very close up uh, and uh, understand the Chinese political system, understand the environmental system. That was a big in inspiration for me to think more about climate change as an area of focus. Um, and then I wrote a master's thesis on climate change and public finance. Uh, I was very uh, intense effort to sort of learn a lot about this uh, big topic and then put it into something you can produce for other people to read. Um, and then came down to Hong Kong and I spent a few years in Hong Kong investing actually in the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, I was given a chance to join a family office that uh, had a focus on TMT and AI. Uh, and I visited about 15 countries in 2018 um, in order to um, really uh, meet the people involved in you know, building the blockchain ecosystem that we see today. A lot of times, you know, we sort of met them at an earlier stage of their journey um, and, uh, and then watched them grow into huge behemoths. Uh, along the way, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, ways that the climate world and the blockchain world can really intersect and touch each other. Uh, and this became the genesis of Carbon Base. Um, and if you go to the Carbon Base website today, um, we have a giant countdown timer at the bottom of the page um, that actually counts down how much time we have left until uh, we use up our 1.5 degree carbon budget. And it's a lot closer than you think. It's actually um, uh, about six years and six months left. Um, and when I learned this news, actually at COP, um, I was sort of staggered to discover that over the next seven years, we will have committed ourselves to a pathway that you know potentially can last for um, a few hundred years. 
Um, and with that knowledge, um, I felt compelled to sort of do something useful and, and meaningful. And that became the, the idea of starting Carbon Base. To be completely honest with you, I did not think I was going to build a climate tech company from day one. Uh, I always thought that I was going to come back and do climate change at the very end of my life um, after I sort of, you know, made my money in some other industry. But once, you know, I was confronted with this timer, I felt like uh, you don't have enough time to do both. You have to do both at the same time. And Carbon Base today is... Um, the, the, what you see here is the, is the beginning of a, in my view, is, is a larger ecosystem. And we have a few members of our team here on the call as well, you know, representing different sectors of it. But um, what we have built already in the public facing side is an ability for individuals to quickly understand what your carbon footprint is, right? You can actually go through and click uh, and answer some questions, log in with Google, and you can sort of see all of the you know, projects we support. Um, and you can also make a profile for yourself. My logged in. Uh, you can make a profile for yourself that uh, captures the number of days that you are carbon neutral. Um, so you can see that I've been carbon neutral for very proudly 200 something days. But this is just the beginning, right? This is actually just, uh, you know, in my view, a, a sort of gateway drug actually into a larger conversation, 264 days carbon neutral. Um, and I've uh, recommended my friends to join. So they've you know, influenced a number of times as well. But this actually is, is a very small tip Right. The larger picture, actually, of what Carbon Base hopes to do is actually to create a protocol that incentivizes individuals to really um, have a chance to uh, participate in the carbon economy. And the carbon economy and the crypto Bitcoin mining economy have a lot of parallels that I hope to you know, dive into with this talk. But suffice to say that it is an economy made out of market participants who are interested in uh, contributing you know, where they can, where they are. And they're sort of feeding into a, a giant pool of, 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 of unified value. And that unified value pool um, actually is our atmospheric climate. Um, and so as we sort of build carbon base, we also sign up all these reward partners. But um, the key nexus of it has been really this, this larger protocol vision. So I'm going to start with this protocol vision here. Um, I'm in China right now, actually, because we just graduated from this program called Miracle Plus, uh, formerly known as Y Combinator China. Um, and the acceptance rate for this thing has been uh, intense. Um, it was uh, about 0.9%, uh, so about 3,000 companies applied. And then the, the group um, essentially um, selected 30 companies. Uh, and the last three months for us has been this massive sprint to try to get our um, uh, finish, you know, to start just have enough things to present for these guys. Um, so let me share screen and here we go. Uh, just give me one second. So, okay, um, we are living through a climate crisis. This is actually one of the most um, urgent problems we face. Um, and you know we are on a path actually to exceed the carrying capacity of our environmental storage for carbon emissions. To give you a sense of scale of how big the problem is, this is the path of the blue line of currently where we are on path to do, right? So we're currently emitting about 50, um, maybe 53 tons of, uh, 53 billion tons of CO2 per year. Uh, and we need to reduce it to something like 25 billion tons in order for us actually to stay underneath the 1.5 degree curve. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, this is a 50% reduction. In the last 40 years of human history, the only time that we've had more than 10% reduction was a global financial crisis, where the entire economy of the world had a heart attack, and the magnitude of that carbon reduction was 10%. So that's the you know sort of tactile feeling of like kind of where we are and how big this this reduction needs to be. So what does it take to reduce this much CO2? Well, first you know we think about the social consensus aspect. In the last 40 years of you know, Earth Day and climate events, there has been uh, a, uh, an ability for us to mobilize you know, increasingly more institutional stakeholders. And here at, the, at you know, the last two years, I would say, has been really a social tipping point. We see from a grassroots side, the millennials have started to take a lot of personal responsibility for the problem. If you were to ask people, do you think this is your problem? Most people actually would say yes. The second is that you know, Greta became very visible actually as the face of a generation of people who are refusing to just you know, go quietly into the night, but actually uh, accept um, the, the fate. So on the institutional side, you know, Lawrence Fink from BlackRock has actually written this you know, very prominent newsletter 
that actually described the reshaping of finance, a fundamental reshaping of finance. And then both Amazon and Google and Tesla have all pledged to be carbon neutral with um, Bezos himself declaring a $10 billion climate pledge as well. And underlying this transformation actually is the idea of a carbon market. A carbon market is the recognition that in order for the you know, capitalistic society to activate, we actually need to put a price on the emission of CO2 itself. And Europe started doing this back in 2005, right? So and for all the people who are you know, calling in from Europe here, good job, guys. Like your legislation managed to uh, you know, be ahead of the curve. Um, and Europe created what's called an ETS emission trading scheme that actually regulated a set of industrial companies who actually have to pay money every year in order to emit CO2. Um, China has been studying this for some time, since 2016. And in the last four years, they've ran seven pilot markets, including Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Tianjin, and Wuhan. Um, and now they're ready to launch a national market. So one of the reasons I'm excited to be in Asia at this time is that actually we're participating in or witnessing the birth of the Chinese carbon market. And then in the United States, thankfully, with the uh, election of Joe Biden, we now have a return to you know, climate science as a, as a mainstream position. And uh, there's now a lot of efforts from the Biden administration to pledge you know, pretty steep cuts in CO2 emissions as well. This is a picture, actually, of an interesting um, thing from COP called Article 6. And Article 6 is the sixth article of the Paris Agreement, which actually talks about the identification and, and uh, an establishment of an international carbon market how different countries can actually interact with each other in terms of their carbon quotas. Uh, and then notably, this gentleman called Mark Carney, who if you guys haven't read this book yet called Values, is an amazing read. He is a lifelong banker. He was the central banker of Canada then the central banker of England, and then became the special envoy for climate finance uh, under the UN. And he has been um, the author of a report called Scaling the Voluntary Carbon Markets, which actually seeks to increase the emission um, coverage of the voluntary market from $1 billion today to $100 billion in the next uh, eight years. So what are the limitations? And this is kind of where I think we're starting to touch a little bit of the interest that people have, right? the blockchain you know, um, experience. When I first read about this, uh, I was like, hmm, it seems to me that there's a, an interesting parallel, but how, do, and how deep does this parallel go? Well, the first thing is that carbon actually as a market is very, um, opaque to most people. Most people have heard about the idea in some form or fashion, but they haven't really, you know, have this been brought to the forefront of their attention. Um, however, um, the uh, last year and a half, I think, has really increased the, the temperature. And I think we're going to see much more of this as an embedding in social consciousness in the next um, two or three years. The second is that uh, the market itself is lacking a lot of sophisticated infrastructure, actually, in order to both validate the creation of carbon credits, as well as to um, uh, trade these things. The, all of the trading happens right now. It's mostly OTC. It's mostly over-the-counter trading. There's very few exchanges that trade these things because actually you're not sure if the credit you're trading is real, if it's you know been you know spent somewhere else. And there's a lot of concerns on, on double spending. Uh, and I think this is actually where my sort of um, attention was really peaked. I was like, huh, it seems like blockchain has actually been whole, the whole point of blockchain is designed to prevent double spending. Like, is there seem you know is there a way actually we can and use some of that technology over here as well. Um, and then the final thing I would say is that compared to other types of uh, markets, the carbon market as a whole suffers from a problem where the buyers are actually um, paying a lot more than the producers are getting. And the, and the middlemen, the brokers actually are taking a very significant part of the margin actually as a carbon offset developer. So this is kind of a, a picture uh, in one view of the entire market. From left to right, we have the registries, which are the um, four global, quote unquote, central banks of the voluntary carbon market. They're the ones who actually mint the credits, the way on trade to the developers, um, which in my view are kind of like Bitcoin miners. They're people actually who spend energy and resources actually to create the carbon credits to get them verified. Then we have the brokers, the people who are selling these credits. Then we have the buyers, which are the you know very bold faced named companies that people understand. And of this ecosystem, um, the process of offsetting you know, goes through this pipeline. So we have project verification, which is um, a process in which the credit, you know, so the, the, the effort to make the credit is sort of developed, uh, originally thought, thought through, then you design it, you write it into blueprint templates, you then register the intention to do the project, you spend the money and time developing the project, you measure the impact at the end of this project, 
then you have to verify the existence of this, you know, the existence product. did you actually plant the trees? Did you actually distribute the cook stoves? How many people are actually using them? And finally, you get your credit, right? And this life cycle can be anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Uh, and finally, when you get your credits, you can then choose to sell it to someone else and sell it to, uh, to um, uh, my friend, and then he can actually decide to cancel it, which cancellation means you destroy the, destroy the credit and it can never be used again. Now, what, I, what drew me to this interesting space actually is the um, registries, because you know, a DLT, a decentralized ledger technology, actually fundamentally is a registry. So I was like, is there actually, does this registry mean the same thing? And it turns out the carbon registries actually are a very significant player. They are, the top four represent 97% of all carbon credits made, right? And the central bank notion comes from the following responsibility. One is that they evaluate the offset developer and they mint the credits that people make. So in terms of printing money, they print credits. They then facilitate the electronic transfer between the entities. So in order to transfer my credits to you, both of us need to actually have an account on the registry. And then I can only, only then I can transfer it to you. Then third is they actually provide the audit trail. So, you know, assuming that I made 50,000 tons of CO2 negative emission units and I transfer 50 over, um, then how do I prove that I've only now 44,000 something, they are the central authority for that. And finally, they provide the listing and search functionality. So um, I started looking at geography and said, you know, where are actually the projects being produced? Like, where is the sort of effort actually reducing CO2 being done? We see a lot of this happening in Asia, um, in Southeast Asia, India, and China. I also see a decent amount of activity in the United States. Um, and the rest of it is in South America, in you know, South Africa, and also parts of um, you know, uh, Australia as well. And then I asked the question, well, where are the registries? Well, the registries right now are fundamentally mostly in North America and one in Switzerland. So there's three in U.S. soil, one, two in California, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Switzerland. So there are actually zero registries in Asia, despite there being actually a lot of the credit creation processes being done out here. Um, so the intention and our sort of great, hairy, big, ambitious goal is actually to build the world's fifth carbon registry. So the top, the previous four have you know, demonstrated that there is an economy that does this. You know, I think that there's a lot of limitations to the way they implemented their technology. I think we can actually build a blockchain native registry from day one and then have that become the genesis of actually the larger economy. You now people actually can make a living from being able to feed effort into the registry and then be paid credits out of it. So what are the big challenges in the market today? One of them is transparency, right? When you look at the credit creation, origination, destruction lifecycle, it's not so easy to be able to fully understand where it comes from, who made it, you know, who validated it, and you know, has it been used before? So I believe that this is you know, something that blockchain kind of gives for free. Like if you look at Etherscan, right, you can see exactly where your transactions are. Like if we had Etherscan for the credits, like we, we don't have a problem searching which credits exist where. The second is there's a cost and time of periodic audits. So it's very expensive and time consuming actually to perform the in-person audits that we have to check to make sure that the trees exist or the you know, cook stove exist. The credit creation process slowed down dramatically in 2020 because of COVID, because people from the global north couldn't fly to the global south anymore to actually to, you know, use a clipboard and check off these things. The third is that there currently isn't a very good reputation system. It's not easy to see, you know, is this developer legit? Have they done this before? You know, how much actually success and track record do these developers have? And then fourth and fifth are that there's not so many opportunities for mainstream adoption. We haven't actually been able to embed the idea of carbon into daily life. Uh, and it doesn't really interact with the, uh, the compliance market. So I won't elaborate into the last part in super close detail, except to say that there's actually two types of carbon markets. There's a voluntary market, which we're talking about here. And there's a compliance market where the government just dictates that the companies have to comply. Usually the compliance market is only for a minority of companies that are the biggest emitter sources, like you know, energy producers, cement, you know, industrial steel. But there's a mechanism in which they allow a certain percentage of the forced to comply markets to have to purchase the voluntary credits. It actually creates more demand for the voluntary credits as well. So where, where does technology come in? Well, if we look at the four things that we, um, we, we sort of identified before, I believe that there is actually a set of you know, parallel mappings. 
So for the transparency side, I think blockchain can increase the, the, the origination transfer destruction like automatically, right? Like just it's, it's, it takes care of itself, so to speak. The second side is for the verification. I think we can use machine learning, remote sensing, satellite imaging actually to drive down the cost and time associated with actually developing the credits. The third, and I think this is actually the key thing that I'm excited to build more of, um, is actually to build more API endpoints. But today, the registries I showed you before, the four, they don't have APIs. Literally, they do not have APIs. So if you want to cancel them, you have to manually go and log into with the username and password, with like click around with your mouse until you actually you know, manage to destroy these things. Um, if you want to have a, a consumer credit card experience, or you know, maybe even a DeFi experience, where every time you take a, every time you make a transaction on a, on Uniswap, you actually, you know, one percent of your transaction fee goes to, to basically canceling carbon credits. That's something that you can build with APIs that I think is very, very powerful. Um, and then finally, we can reduce the middleman fees. Um, so the mapping, and I'll, I'll get to questions in. 10 minutes and we can have a whole Q&A session. Um, but thank you for your questions. I'd love to you know, build a pipeline of them to, to talk through. Um, I think that this is the slide that really you know, convinced me this is something that's worth doing. Because I looked at all of the key functionalities of what goes into making a registry work. And I found a one-to-one -one mapping with the things that blockchains already do. So there's a reputation management system actually for um, auditing the project. And we can actually build that with a staking slashing validator network right so if you are a valid if you are a auditor you have to stake um, some tokens and then if you um, you know fail in your job or fail, find out that the project you sort of validated was actually you know uh, fraudulent then we just burn your stake or right? slash your stake um, and then there's a minting carbon credits we can have tokens represent that we can monitor the project's progress and so here we can actually work with the oracle system actually to feed into the smart contracts you know, satellite data into the uh, into the credit issuance entities. We have a user account system. You know, here we can create UIUDs for everything now with, with Ethereum or any other major chain uh, and then facilitation and transfer of credits. And, and here's something really interesting, which is that at a metaphysical level, what's happening here is that we are going through the process of actually using tokens to represent intangible value that we know is important, right? So biodiversity, carbon, you know, ocean life preservation, you know, all these things have a hard time of fitting into the traditional corporate accounting book. But I believe, and we all believe that, you know, there is actually intrinsic value here, but how do we actually embody it? And I think what I'm arguing is I think that tokenized economy actually is, is the best way to argue it. So the nature-based solution um, headline is an idea that's been slowly, you know, taking more shape and prominence inside the uh, environmental conservation space. Actually, there are tools built in nature that we can use actually to reduce CO2. We don't have to build giant, you know, vacuum cleaners that sort of suck carbon from the sky. Um, and so we sort of see that the three elemental building blocks are one, you know, satellite data, two, you know, machine learning, uh, and three, smart contract uh, reward generation. Uh, and we actually want to emphasize that the people who should be receiving the funding are the people who actually are at the base of the pyramid, people actually living at the front lines of the environmental degradation. They're the ones who actually should have the you know, uh, best uh, return for their efforts. Uh, and, and we actually have some examples. So this is a, a collaborator of ours. This is a, they started taking satellite pictures down in uh, Peru, actually close to the Amazon, uh, in order to actually visualize what deforestation looks like on the grounds. So these little you know, straight green lines here, these are all roads that have been cleared into the forest right, along the major you know, stem. And this is actually what deforestation looks like at a satellite level. So today they're capturing resolution about 30 by 30 meters. Um, and I, I think that we're gonna see this resolution increase uh, over the next few years. Um, so, you know, we, we sort of took some of the inspiration here and sort of proposed it into a into AI for good challenge. But I think the, the interesting infrastructure piece of it actually is that we can connect between the smart contracts. Uh, we can connect the people who are community oriented and actually doing the environmental conservation work and reward them on a real-time basis, on a 24-hour basis with the people buying the credits. So that's kind of the, the monetary flow. And then on the, on the top end is now sort of like the, the empirical verification piece. Um, and so here is the uh, red plus projects that our uh, partners are implementing. They're called Elcot. Um, and their credits currently live on Vera. And this is kind of, you know, some of the satellite pictures they've taken actually to 
demonstrate this. So it's not easy to build a registry. And, and uh, I think it's similar, you know, as hard as it's probably slightly easier than building a central bank, but it's, it's definitely, you know, along that same category. So you need a lot of like raw building ingredients actually to go into being used together. So from my own sort of survey, uh, we sort of broken down to these four buckets. We need to have a, a, a authoritative, trustworthy foundation. We need some legal backing from really powerful people with reputations that can sort of sustain the creation of a registry. Then we need to have the commercial side. So we need to have um, project developers who are willing to register their project on this registry as opposed to the other four. We need to have demand. So, you know, we need Disney or Netflix that want to buy credits from this registry as opposed to you know, the other ones. And then finally, there's a whole technology piece. How do you actually build the database, you know, do the remote sensing, build the APIs, and so on and so on. Uh, and then the enhancement, as, as we sort of see, look at this, actually is around the data inputs um, and, and all of the extended peripheries that come actually once we have a, a blockchain registry. So we have um, digital document submission. We can have you know, permanent ledger um, tracking of the data records. We actually can have like NFTs that actually can power the rewards of individuals who sort of you know, purchase credits. Um, we can have satellite imaging for MRV. Uh, governance tokens actually to allow more than just five or six people on the board of directors to influence the decisions of the registry, but actually have a, a community-led registry with maybe a few thousand people voting. Uh, and finally, investments, which is that traditionally the project developers have actually been using their own money actually to sort of make the carbon credits work. We can actually use um, the companies to develop their own supply as well. Or you can use finance to develop their own supply. So where we are today, um, we made this roadmap back in 2020, so um, end of December. So some of these things we've, we've, we've succeeded on, other ones we haven't, so I'll sort of bait ourselves. Um, we are building the API access, so hopefully that's gonna be finished by sometime end of this month. Um, we have a very general schema. Uh, we've uh, worked on actually an NFT um, token for endangered animals with WWF. Um, the machine learning stuff has been a little slower than I thought. Um, and we did recruit this amazing advisor, actually, who worked as uh, Ban Ki-moon's um, uh, chief, chief economic advisor. So he helped make the SDGs that we all know and love. Um, and then we started building relationships with, with the financial side. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we haven't yet contacted Officer Ban Ki-moon yet, but uh, he is definitely on our hit list because he is the first Asian person to become a Secretary General of the UN. Right. And so we think that as we need to get this thing off the ground, like he would be kind of an anchor stakeholder for us to, to work with. Um, and, uh, and some of the other things we'll, we'll share with you. The team that we've built um, come from a mix of technology, finance, you know, science, research, and, uh, uh, and you know, uh, consulting. And so that's kind of our, our sort of um, stakeholder group. Uh, I'll sort of skip over the, the team itself, uh, except to say that they're wonderful people. Some of them are on this call. I hope you guys can really have a chance to meet them and, and love to you know, have you guys you know, just hear about their own incredible stories. Um, uh, Joe is, is the guy I mentioned who worked uh, for the Secretary General before. Uh, and then we also have uh, the global chairman, A.T. Kearney, the big consulting company. Uh, we have a guy who um, was the first person to start trading carbon in the UK uh, for Barclays also uh, someone who's helped start this thing called the US-China Green Fund. Um, and that's the that's sort of it. Uh, we, asked, we sort of worked on some corporate costs. So as we sort of bootstrap this, we need to have real world people endorse this, right? It can't just be a thing that lives in the air. So a lot of our efforts these days actually spent, you know, trying to convince a major company to actually to, to consider working with us to, to calculate the carbon footprint and then to neutralize themselves. Um, and that's kind of where we are right now. We're sort of helping you know, real estate companies, shipping companies, supply chain companies, and uh, energy management companies go through the process of, of calculating their carbon footprint. Um, so yeah, well, this is a great idea. So for the carbon-based team, feel free to uh, maybe add carbon-based to your name. And, uh, and then if we do have breakout sessions afterwards, we can have a chance to chat. I'll just give a quick shout out to your people on the list. We have, I think, um, I saw Alicia earlier. Uh, we have Anita um, from, from Hong Kong. Uh, we have Roy, who just answered the question for us. Jacqueline, who's uh, he heading up our summer communications efforts. Um, and I think that's it, yeah. So let me kind of stop here for a second. Um, and 
sort of summarize this, I think in, in, in I can going back to this slide here. Um, I believe that um, there's a, a really powerful nexus between the idea of uh, climate change being a global problem that needs to be mobilized by the actions of individuals with the ability for us to build a global incentive program through blockchain, right? To me, you know, all of the major protocols are actually incentive programs. They specify a value creation mechanism in which individual actors can do something that is valuable to the network and they get paid for it. Either it's mining, it's staking, it's, you know, uh, verification, it's even just writing blogs where you get paid for that. So if we can take that incentive mechanism you know, game theory design, and we actually can bring it to, you know, one of the big challenges we face, which is, you know, the planetary question, I think we can actually mobilize a lot of people, right, you know, maybe even a billion people to actually participate in the economy of saving the planet. And I see carbon credits actually as being the beginning of a, of a larger basket of other credits. I think there's going to be credits for plastic, for, for waste, right, for water. Um, a lot of the natural resources we've largely taken for granted for biodiversity, are going to be, you know, creditized in order to actually have, you know, hold economic value. And we've already been blessed with the incredible rich digital asset infrastructure that's made trading these, these assets, you know, very um, simple. Uh, and so now we're in the journey of actually extending that to from the pure digital world now into the, in the real world. Um, so with that, thank you guys very much for your attention and uh, look forward to the discussions. Amazing. Thanks so much, Max. That was super inspiring and, you know, learned so much and like such a cool mission and vision. Love to hear in terms of like the next three to five years, like what, what's your, your dream or vision with, with Carbon Base and how, how do you feel the blockchain can, can play a pivotal role in that? Please. Yeah, well, I think that the, um, we do hope to launch a registry itself in the next three to five years. Um, and, and that's really the, the roadmap I'm working off of, right? So if you think about it, um, it's kind of a, uh, uh, it's kind of like building Optimus Prime or like building like a Transformers robot. You sort of like have four separate cars you need to sort of get started and then you can like put them into a giant robot. So there is the ability for us to, to win on the political side and actually have endorsements from senior, you know, uh, government officials to sort of, you know, pull something off like this. We need to have, you know, corporates recognize that there's value in actually reducing their CO2 and using credits as a way to do so. We can have project developers, you know, committing to, working with us actually, because it takes, you know, 12 months to make, make some credits, right? They need to actually lock themselves in for that journey. And then finally, we need incredible blockchain engineers who can help um, design actually all of the nuances of how, how we validate, you know, a, a protocol that streams large amounts of information in, as well as, um, you know, sort of engages with, with a validated network. Um, so I think that's, that's the pathway. Like, I think somehow, not somehow, like, you know, understandably, as we talk to like potential investors, they're like, like, you're doing like four things at once. And I'm like, yes, there are four things, but they like, they sort of feed together into this one thing. Um, and, uh, and I think this is kind of the, the architectural vision of, of how this thing fits together. Um, and actually, most recent news, there's, uh, there's been a lot of movements in Singapore. So uh, Singapore actually had three carbon, uh, carbon exchanges launched in the next, last, uh, I would say, months. Uh, and so we sort of see that, uh, you know, we're sort of at the cusp of, of this thing where the government of South Singapore itself is actually trying to, to do more in this space. And uh, I hope that we get to, like, it's, it's kind of fascinating, right? Like when you're building a company, it's like wave surfing, like the waves are bigger than you, but uh, you have to sort of understand like where you are relative to the wave. And like, do you have enough speed actually to catch the wave? And so I can see that there's a wave going and I'm just trying to spend every day, making sure we like paddle a bit faster enough to like, you know, be when the wave hits itself. Amazing. A nice question here from Kevin um, Verrand. What effect has COVID had on active carbon footprint? Um, COVID actually, as Roy mentioned earlier, has reduced the total global emissions by 5% or so. Uh, but the effect is now quickly reversing as more companies, as a company, where countries are coming out of lockdown, we see that go you know, right back up. Um, a lot of these savings have actually been from travel. So a lot of, um, you know, airline flights actually, you know, stopped flying altogether. And that's actually been, you know, the major source. But from a consumer standpoint side, people have not stopped buying things during COVID, actually. You know, so e-commerce has really done really well. And, and uh, I think all of the manufacturing associated, the emission associated with that has actually continued. Um, I see COVID actually as an interesting pregame 
to the May challenge, uh, to the major challenge, right? The pregame in the sense that we've had to work across international borders on a problem that doesn't really respect ethnicity or geography is, is very much. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, the same is true for climate change, but now you need to spend a lot more effort. You can't just take a COVID test and, and uh, be over. Um, and then, yeah, you know, go ahead. A question here from Ida. Um, how do you feel about NFTs? Can you talk about more on the NFT to, to your project, how it fits in? Of course. So one of our projects we're very excited to, to share with you underneath um, the, uh, underneath the um, general project itself actually is called Project Arc. So this came out of a, a TED talk we helped organize in Hong Kong that um, sort of spun to something more. Um, and um, the idea was really to create uh, digital collectibles, NFTs essentially, that actually are tied to the physical world. So we call it digital collectibles that make a difference. Um, and it's actually a collaboration with the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, because they are the largest NGO actually on protecting endangered animals. And we want to create, uh, you know, similar Noah's Ark. We want to create a, a mechanism by which people actually can, you know, help the animals. So we have been looking at different environmental conservation groups, you know, large conservation uh, arenas in Africa, um, and also community-led conservation areas in, in Europe. Um, and we created um, these, these NFTs that um, are... I think these are the first NFTs branded with the WWF logo in the world. Um, and they represent a piece of Romanian cultural heritage. Um, and then beyond that, um, we recently signed this collaboration with Chainlink because we actually want to tie the behavior NFT between the physical world and the, and the digital world. So this is not something that's been fully built yet, but the, the sort of general direction of the collaboration is that we're going to start making NFTs that actually respond to environmental disasters, extinction events, or um, or, or happiness or, or repopulation growth, right? Actually happening on the ground, reflected in NFT itself. Um, and then team is a, a mix of people from carbon-based side as well as you know the WWF itself. So we see this um, this journey actually in the in the following sense: um, we um, are trying to um, capture the intangible value of what conservation looks like on the ground into beautiful art, right? And change the way that people donate. Because if you were just to be a, a sign up to be a donator for, you know, charity, like all you get at the end of the year is just another email, you know, asking for, for, for more money, essentially. But here, if you actually own one of the digital collectibles that we have, and we have some pretty cool artwork, let's see if I can click one of these, um, then you can actually have this thing that you can display on your wall, on your gallery, and then maybe you, you can even sell it next year for something else. So there's a, a secondary market uh, that actually rewards the early collectors um, that um, uh, are, are participants of this uh, of, of this uh, giving campaign, uh, and so we see the WWF actually as one of the first stakeholders. But we you know, we really want to work with a larger basket of, of global NGOs and actually create NFTs that are sort of tied to their stories. I think there's like a video in place as well. There's there's sound actually. So if you guys have a chance to check out the the web page, you guys can. Uh, uh, listen to the audiovisual experiences that uh, we had a, a community of about 20 artists or so kind of, you know, spend a decent amount of time, you know, creating these uh, gorgeous artworks that, that sort of contain some connection to, you know, the, 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 the natural world will kind of help. Um, and I think that's something else that, uh, you know, very happy to sort of listen to more, you know, what, what are sort of additional ideas people have of, of ways to use NFTs. I don't see NFTs as being only art itself. I think they actually contain the ability to have rich metadata that actually encapsulates more of, of, our, of our working world. Um, but yeah, okay. over back to you. How you manage to sort of get people over the tipping point. You know, for someone like who doesn't care about carbon emissions or the environment to someone who's like, okay, I want to be part of this movement. I want to support, like, what is the moment when people are like, okay, this makes sense. I want to support. Uh, and also for the blockchain space, a lot of people are very skeptical towards how tokens can incentivize behavior or blockchain or cryptocurrencies. Curious to hear the tipping point for that too. Um, it's a great question. Well, I think that the tipping point for the environmental conservation is a generational thing. I think anyone who is 25 and younger, like really, you know, feels like it's going to be a, a big problem. Like, uh, you know, we have one of our, our teammates, Alicia, she has a eight-year-old daughter who is extremely 
eloquent and uh, has, um, I, I think, said a few sentences, you know, just even as we're having our, our daily stand-up calls that sort of remind me actually that the younger generation actually know a lot more about the world than we think they do. And they see it as a big problem that they're going have to have to live with. Um, and I think, you know, not to sort of be uh, too negative on the, on the older generations, but I think there's almost a learned helplessness that comes with age. Like we haven't done, you know, we know about this problem. We haven't done it enough for, for a long time. Like, you know, it doesn't matter where you start now kind of thing. Cause you know, maybe I'll be gone before it really hits the, hits the planet. But if you're like 16 years old, I mean, this is going to be the next of your life you, you, you deal with. Um, with the incentive schemes, um, I think that, um, and I don't think that we've fully been successful in doing this yet, but I will say that, um, you know, DeFi really, for me, opened my eyes. I was like, wow, you can have, you know, this yield farming concept, um, you know, for, for a business activity that gives value to your particular business, you can actually incentivize that with tokens, right? So what we want to do, and we haven't done this yet for regulatory reasons, but we will, is to yield farm for being carbon neutral or yield farm for actually you know, reducing your footprint. So we can actually find some way of creating an economic model where we can give away people tokens actually for their particular behavior. And I think that actually is gonna be a, a pretty cool sort of S curve of like getting people who you know, otherwise would be apathetic to sort of care more about. You think about how, how fervent the, the Ave or the compound you know, yield farmers are uh, on Twitter. Um, and I think the third question is um, with regards to like general community adoption. Like, here's my controversial opinion. I think that like climate change is a killer app for, for crypto. Uh, and we see this now with the Elon Musk Bitcoin conversation. Like if I said that statement two months ago, like people would be like, I don't really think that that's really, but now like everyone in the world has, has heard about Bitcoin and heard about, you know, the, 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 the climate decision and, and really that nexus um, coupling, right? I, I think is so, so powerful because if you don't care about crypto, but you do care about the climate, I mean, this is that that's one group of people. Then there's a group of people who don't really think so much about the climate yet, but who care a lot about, about crypto. And so if we can put both of these people together into one camp, um, I think we can reach like, you know, a quarter of the world. So Amazing. And, and how important is education in that? Like, do, do you see yourself playing a role in educating people on ways that they can be more uh, carbon neutral or be more aware of, you know, the, the timeline by which emissions need to be reduced? Um, I, I think so. Um, there is, uh, um, I think that there's a lot of uh, nuanced ways to actually understand where our emissions come from. And I think the climate question in general actually is a, is a process by which we sort of think through, like, you know, we think through our, our daily life, right? Like, you know, beef, you know, is, is, is a very clear example. You know, people understand that beef is really bad for the environment. They don't really understand how bad. Like, if you see the graph of how bad it is, like, I think it's, it's hard for you to eat beef again, like, unless you, like, do something to mitigate your impact. Um, let me just show this picture to you. Like, I sort of have this belief that the data is the best argument for behavioral change, if you are open to it, if you sort of believe it, right? Or if you're, if you're willing to, 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 you know, adopt new information in general. So here's just a, a screen from the visual capitalist uh, that looks at the climate greenhouse gas of food. Um, and, you know, I've really only recently paid closer attention to, to all these, these things. Um, here is beef. So for one kg of beef, you're actually creating about 60 kg of emissions, right? To give you a sense, one kg of, of chicken gives you six. So it's a 10x difference. You know, one kg of, uh, of corn, you know, is a 60x difference. So that is insane. <laughs> and unless you see this graph, like you don't know. But once you see this graph, you can't, un you can't unknow or you can, but like, then, then, you, then you have to go over your own sort of sense of guilt. So I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of this idea of like, you know, just putting up this information in front of people, you know, incentivizing them even to, to pay attention to it, to learn about it. Um, it was a really fascinating comment one of my colleagues made, which is like, she was like, I don't want to watch the, uh, the Seaspiracy um, documentary because I know that as soon as I finish watching it, like, it's going to force me to, to change my diet. <laughs> I'm not ready to change yet, <laughs> but people understand that. So I think education is a very key part of it. And I think what you guys are doing at Unventures is, is an amazing global education network. So 
I really hope that there's more ways we can work with your community, you know, um, and uh, and help disseminate this, right? And 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 eventually, you know, we're also talking to a few schools and you know summer programs. How do we build curriculum that actually you know helps uh, create this idea? Amazing, and love to hear what's the biggest risk or challenges. So if you look at, you know, the next three to five years in terms of getting to your vision and goal, like what are the big roadblocks or things that are kind of in the way that sort of prevent you from reaching that? And like, what's it going to take? You know, how can people support? How can people get involved? Yeah, well, I think that um, there's a question anytime you start a project of like, you know, what are the, like, there's an existential question, right? Like, can we continue doing this? And so one of the things I've been, working on recently is actually, you know, after graduating from the YC Demo Day, I'm starting to meet, you know, a lot of uh, Chinese-based uh, investor groups actually to see, you know, is people willing to put money uh, on actually the, the question of China's carbon neutrality. Um, China is not the most token-friendly place. I mean, they're very keen on blockchain itself. And so we've sort of had to tailor part of our story um, to, to the emission recording aspect and not so much emphasize on, on the trading aspect. But that, that, that's those, you know, it's context dependent, right? In Hong Kong, we can do that more. In Singapore, we can think, think about the, the whole picture. But um, I don't really think, and this is with our transparency of our team on the call, like, I don't think we're going to um, stop doing this, right? Like, I, it just makes too much sense, right? So like, even if catastrophic case, like somehow we run out of money, I'm going to have to like recapitalize the company and like start from scratch. Like I see, I think of the, the journey we're on, like it seems inevitable, right? And this is actually the other thing. The carbon, carbon is a value thing. It's already reached social consensus, right? There is actually now the UN, like the UN hired a person to basically try to grow the carbon market, right? That's as good, that's, that's as gold plate institutional as you can get in, in, this, in, this, in this world. But carbon is a very different commodity or different asset class compared to like gold or silver because it is fundamentally a digital recorded item. You can't hold, touch, or ship a ton of carbon, right? It just lives on a, a database somewhere. So I believe that actually the ability for us to create and, and move around digital assets using blockchain is actually the best way to do so. It is way more efficient to do that than to, than to, than to put it on an on Excel spreadsheet somewhere. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's my honest, honest answer. I mean, thanks so much, Max. And maybe f final question before we move to the breakout rooms and I'm sure we have some more questions in the breakout rooms. Love to hear your happiest moment. So in building a carbon base, what's been the moment that you've gone like, wow, this is, this is amazing and, and really fulfilling? Like, Yeah, well, we, we had a really crazy um, conference experience where, where we were actually using this thing called Gather Town. Um, and uh, we sort of had the chance to host a, a remote conference for New York City students actually on climate change. And, and, and uh, we were able to partner with the guy that made a really big, beautiful gather time map. Um, and at the end of the conference, which was very, very intense, um, our team kind of had little avatars because we've, we've been spread around the world, right? Carbon based as a, as a team, you know, we have people in, in like, we have one guy in Berlin, two guys in US, Canada, uh, Hong Kong, um, and then you know, some people in China and other places. We haven't actually physically had a chance to get together yet as a, as, a, as a whole effort. So we sort of had the whole team kind of walk to a part of the map in Gather Town where they put a, a, the ISS space station. And then it's also, there was a, it was a picture of like the moon, like looking at the earth and uh, a little avatar Pokemon, people were just kind of standing there and watching this earth and being like, you know what? That's the thing we're fighting for. Like this is, and it was a cool, it was a cool out-of-body experience actually to see, see all these people. And that was a very peak, peak moment for me. Um, Amazing. Well, thank, thanks so much, Max. Really appreciate your time and, and learning from you. And yeah, looking forward to see you soon and, and, and catch up in person. We'll just open thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, really appreciate your, your questions as well.